Hello, ninth grade, and welcome to second semester. Boy, second semester already. You guys are going to be 10th graders before we know it. 10th grade. Oh, no, that's chemistry. You thought biology was hard. Wait till you get to chemistry. Things always seem to need help with chemistry. Well, I'll be there for you next semester if you need any help with chemistry. All right, so let's get started with unit five. And we have three systems that we're looking at um, for unit five, respiratory, digestive, and circulatory. And we're starting with respiratory which says it's all about gas exchange. And that's your first question in the guided notes, which is which gases do you think we're going to be talking about in this lesson? And so you just have to think about well, what did we learn last semester in terms of cellular respiration and photosynthesis? What were the two gases, right, that we talked about all the time? And you'll put those down there. And there's some hints coming up. So the importance of respiration, your body cells require oxygen, all right? So there's one of your gases. And hopefully you will have put down what the second gas is. So looking at your question three here, uh, what molecules are produced from cellular respiration? Right, so what molecules are required for cellular respiration is number question two, and what molecules are produced is your question three. So cellular respiration, remember, was uh, glucose plus oxygen gives you carbon dioxide and water and ATP. Okay, so um, you'll put down the answers to question two and three. And then question four is to write the balanced chemical equation for cellular respiration. So what I just said, glucose plus oxygen, and then arrow, and then carbon dioxide and water. And remember to make it a balanced equation um, you'll be doing a lot of balancing of equations next year in chemistry. So this one is an easy one. And uh, don't forget, you can use the shortcut command comma to do the subscripts, okay? And so uh, here's a review. So oxygen and glucose are used by cells to produce ATP. We call that cellular respiration. And in addition to releasing the energy, then also the waste product, carbon dioxide, is produced and water is also a waste product in cellular respiration. So um, let's link these two things together. Um, sorry, let me just look at your guided notes here. It says name, what is the name of the process that puts oxygen in our atmosphere in the first place? So, sorry, my dog is right here. It's right there, right? So photosynthesis, this is where the oxygen comes from in the first place and then is used in cellular respiration and carbon dioxide is then released from cellular respiration, becomes a reactant for photosynthesis. And question six asks you to write the balanced chemical equation for that process. So remember that cellular respiration and photosynthesis is the flip side of the same coin. So whatever chemical equation you wrote for number four, you're just going to reverse it. And there's your answer for number six. Okay. So um, the respiratory system sustains cellular respiration by supplying that oxygen that is required for cellular respiration and removes the waste product when you breathe out, okay? So that is the connection between these two things. And they have similar names and sometimes students will conflate the two uh, and think that the respiratory system is the same thing as cellular respiration, it's not. It's two different things, but obviously they're connected. So the respiratory system, this is your hardware of you know, your lungs and your breathing in and breathing out supports cellular respiration, which is taking place in the mitochondria, and that is breaking down your food, which requires oxygen, and the waste product is carbon dioxide. So the respiratory system provides that oxygen and removes the carbon dioxide, right? So that's the connection between the respiratory system and cellular respiration. They are two things. And that you'll explain that for number seven. All right, so the importance of the respiratory system can be broken into two processes, breathing and respiration. And first is breathing is the mechanical movement of air into and out of your lungs. And then secondly, um, you have respiration. And now respiration is the gas exchange part. So first of all, we just mechanically need to get air in and out of our lungs. Secondly, we need for that gas exchange to take place. And there's external respiration, internal respiration. And you can see the difference there. 
So external is that exchange of gas between the atmosphere and blood that's on the other side of your, of your lungs. And then internal is then between the blood and your body cells. So that happens everywhere else in the rest of your body. Okay? So external respiration is happening between the boundary between your lungs and the bloodstream just on the other side of your lungs. And internal respiration is happening everywhere else in the body. This is a diagram showing you the hardware, if you like, of your respiratory system. And you can see your question 10 has got a list there of these very same items, right, uh, that you see on this diagram. And in the next image, excuse me, so here they are listed for you. So starting with the uh, nasal passages, right, your nose and your mouth, the nasal passages, air passes across the pharynx and then uh, again across the larynx and there is an epiglottis that is right here right it's not listed in one of these um, it's not labeled here but the epiglottis is right there and that prevents food and water from going down the wrong pipe right going down your trachea food and water goes down your esophagus into your stomach but it shouldn't go down into your lungs. And the epiglottis has a very important function. It's that flap that stops food and water from going down the trachea and into your lungs. So you have the trachea, lungs, obviously, and then you have the bronchi, singular is bronchus, right? So you have a right bronchus and a left bronchus. And remember, right and left is always reversed when you're looking at your patient. And then you have bronchioles, which are smaller tubes, and then finally, ends up with the in the alveoli okay and the diaphragm is this very important muscle here which is going to cause your thoracic cavity to increase in volume and decrease in volume as you'll see okay so here's this image here and you have your um your word bank and you need to complete this um the labeling here in the table that is in your notes okay so I'm gonna let you guys do that so just so that this video doesn't get too long right so you can do that on your own I think it's pretty straightforward okay uh, all right so let's talk then about gas exchange we're just going to look at this um, brief video here oh excuse me let me just stop here and before we watch the video you do have a couple of questions there, true and false, both air and food pass through the pharynx, right? So uh, if we go back here, yes, right? So both air and food will pass through the pharynx, right? So the pharynx kind of is like this, this um, place here, um, but Okay, but it doesn't go down the esophagus. Um, so, excuse me, the, the epiglottis is there, so the air and food does not go into the trachea, but goes down the esophagus instead. Okay, uh, another term for the larynx is the voice box. And another term for the larynx is the voice box. And then your question 14 is true or false? Both air and food pass through the trachea, right? So I just said that no. You don't want air and food going down the trachea. So that is false, right? Otherwise you have to cough it up. And then question 15 says, Kehau has a faulty epiglottis. It doesn't always close when it should. What would be a symptom of a faulty epiglottis? So if you had a faulty epiglottis, then every time you ate or very frequently, um, little crumbs and things would be going down into your trachea and your reaction would be to cough it up. So someone who has a faulty epiglottis very frequently is coughing up to try and force whatever crumbs or water droplets went down the wrong tube out because you do not want crumbs and, and fluid gathering down here in your lungs and causing inflammation um, in your lungs or blocking the passage of air in your lungs. That's why you cough it up, right? The body's reaction is to cough it up. Okay. So let's take a look at this video. Now with this video, you'll see question 16. There are um, questions that go along with this video. So what you will do is um, you will stop and start this video uh, to 
to fill in those questions. I won't do it now because that will make this, this video very long, my presentation very long, right? But I'm just going to show this and then you can stop and start in order to complete questions for number 16. Many of us have hundreds of things on our minds at any moment, often struggling to keep track of everything we need to do. But fortunately, there's one important thing we don't have to worry about remembering, breathing. When you breathe, you transport oxygen to the body's cells to keep them working and clear your system of the carbon dioxide that this work generates. Breathing, in other words, keeps the body alive. So how do we accomplish this crucial and complex task without even thinking about it? It lies in our body's respiratory system. Like any machinery, it consists of specialized components and requires a trigger to start functioning. Here, the components are the structures and tissues making up the lungs, as well as the various other respiratory organs connected to them. And to get this machine moving, we need the autonomic nervous system. Our brains uncover. Okay, so that, for example, is your answer to A, right? So the um, autonomic nervous system. Such as control center for the vital functions. As the body prepares to take in oxygen-rich air, this system sends a signal to the muscles around your lungs, flattening the diaphragm and contracting the intercostal muscles between your ribs to create more space for the lungs to expand. Air then whooshes into your nose and mouth, through your trachea, and into the bronchi that split at the trachea's base, with one entering each lung. Like tree branches, these small tubes divide into thousands of tinier passages, called bronchioles. It's tempting to think of the lungs as huge balloons, but instead of being hollow, they're actually spongy inside, with the bronchioles running through. Okay, so by now, B and C, right? We should have answered B and C. And D. Explain your choice above. Throughout the parenchyma tissue, at the end of each bronchiole is a little air sac called an alveolus, wrapped in capillaries full of red e. blood cells containing special proteins called hemoglobin. The air you've breathed in fills these sacs, causing the lungs to inflate. Here is where the vital exchange occurs. At this point, the capillaries are packed with carbon dioxide and the air sacs are full of oxygen. But due to the basic process of diffusion, the molecules of each gas want to move to a place where there is a lower concentration of their kind. So as oxygen... Okay, so remember diffusion, if they're moving from high concentration to low concentration, right, the ball rolling downhill, high to low, is that active transport or is that passive diffusion? Oxygen crosses over to the capillaries, the hemoglobin grabs it up while the carbon dioxide is unloaded into the lungs. The oxygen-rich hemoglobin is then transported throughout the body via the bloodstream. But what do our lungs do with all that carbon dioxide? Exhale it, of course. The autonomic nervous system kicks in again, causing the diaphragm to ball up and the intercostal muscles to relax, making the chest cavity smaller and forcing the lungs to compress. The carbon dioxide-rich air is expelled and the cycle begins again. So all of that was your answer for G. Okay, so you might want to rewind and... So that's how these spongy organs keep our bodies efficiently supplied with air. Lungs inhale and exhale between 15 and 25 times a minute, which amounts to an incredible 10,000 liters of air each day. That's a lot of work, but don't sweat it. Your lungs and your autonomic nervous system have got it covered. Okay, so again, you can just rewind as you need to to um to complete to complete those questions for the video all right i'm just going to get back to my system here okay back into the presenter all right uh so this is another um this is another animation of how the breathing takes place and how this gas exchange takes place. Remember, it's all about gas exchange. So you can see that you have um, the hardware, this, you know, your ribs and your diaphragm. So it's just going to boot up. Are work together in tandem so that your thoracic cavity will increase in volume and decrease in volume. 
And that increasing and decreasing in volume changes the pressure, right? So as it increases in volume, now there's a lower pressure in your lungs, so air will rush in. And then as you decrease that volume, you're increasing the pressure, and so the air is forced out. So that's um, mechanically how air gets in and out of our bodies. And then this central image here, so this is showing you the alveoli, okay, the sometimes called bunches of grapes because they look like little bunches of grapes. And again, a closer uh, view of this, this is be an alveoli here, you see this pinkish looking gas, that's oxygen, and then the blue gas is carbon dioxide. And these little red kidney bean looking uh, things, those are your red blood cells. And so your red blood cells are what actually carry the oxygen and the carbon dioxide around your body. So when the red blood cells come up to this very thin boundary here between the alveolus and the capillary, this thin, it has to be very thin to allow time for, you know, small um, distance for oxygen to diffuse across that boundary and be picked up by red blood cells and for the carbon dioxide to be released into the alveolus and then you will exhale. So if this space was thicker, then it would be more difficult for that gas exchange to occur. And we're gonna talk about this later on when we do talk about uh, diseases of the lungs and we'll talk about coronavirus as well. It makes this distance here bigger, right? It's, you get um, fluid and inflammation and this swells up, which makes it very difficult now for oxygen and carbon dioxide to diffuse in and out. Okay, so that's what that is all about. Uh, going back to your notes here, question 17. Uh, the chemicals in cigarette smoke. Okay, let me go back to my presentation. The chemicals in cigarette smoke and other smoking products temporarily paralyze the movement of cilia. What would be a direct outcome of this? So if we look at the path of air, as air travels from the outside to the inside, you know, breathing through your nose, right? So first of all, the air has to pass across all of these little hairs here. And some of you are going like, you, <laughs> those are very necessary, those little hairs. And they're called cilia, okay? So air passes across the cilia, and the job of the cilia is to filter out the large particles, right? And those cilia are actually attached to cells which are producing a mucus, which will warm and moisten the air and traps foreign materials, right? So these are the little cilia, and this is the mucus, and you want to trap these, these bad guys and in this mucus, and then this mucus literally will like drain down the back of your, um, of your nasal passages here and actually go down into your pharynx and then you'll swallow it. So instead of going into the trachea, it will go down into the esophagus and end up in your stomach, right? And then your stomach juices, which are highly acidic, will take care of these little guys and, and you're good to go, okay? Uh, so that cilia are very important. So question then, uh, the chemicals in cigarettes actually paralyze the movement of the cilia. So the cilia, uh, they're like, um, you know, like uh, wind on a wheat field. You know how all the little, um, you know, the heads of wheat will kind of um, swing back and forth in a wave-like motion. So cilia do the same thing. So they're always, and the cilia go all the way down into your trachea. So they don't just stop in your nose. They go all the way down to the trachea. And they're always kind of sweeping, but they sweep in one direction. They're always sweeping upwards. So anything that does, um, any kind of particles, dust particles that get past like your nasal passages will be caught by these other cilia here and in the mucus. And then the cilia are sweeping that mucus up, right? They sweep the mucus up and up and up back into the back of your nasal passages and then down into your um, esophagus, right? Down into your stomach. So you swallow it. That's important to swallow that stuff. If you paralyze those cilia by smoking, which is what happens, then they can't do their job. So they can't sweep things up. So if you paralyze the cilia, then all of those viruses and, and dust particles and bacteria get through, 
right? They get past the cilia because it's like the guards are asleep and then down into your lungs. And then of course you are going to have uh, trouble breathing, right? You will get inflammation in your lungs when you have all these bad guys getting in there, okay? So uh, that is what the cilia do. So there's an outcome, right? That the dust particles, bacteria and viruses would end up in your lungs and cause an infection. All right, so uh, question 18, starting with the nose mouth, use the word bank below to trace the passage of oxygen molecules. Okay, so um, you have, and I'm going through it now, right? So we started out, we started out here, air going past the, into the nose and mouth to the pharynx, right? Past the cilia, the pharynx, and then from the pharynx across the epiglottis, prevents food from getting into your lungs, across the larynx and the trachea, and then from the trachea through the bronchi, and then to the bronchioles, and then finally to the alveoli. Okay, so you can um, stop and, and complete question 18. And then from the alveoli, you saw that the, um, the oxygen is then passed into one of those red blood cells. And inside those red blood cells, we have hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is what will pick up the oxygen finally. And then we'll talk about hemoglobin um, in the next few slides here. Okay, so uh, again, looking at question 18, so hemoglobin will pick up that oxygen, and where is that oxygen going to end up, right? So go right back to the beginning of this lesson. Why do we need oxygen, right? It's for cellular respiration. So cellular respiration takes, takes place in the mitochondria, so eventually this oxygen is going to end up in the mitochondrion, okay? So that's some help with question 18. Uh, so the pathway, path of air, so air will travel into the alveoli where oxygen will diffuse across those thin walls into the capillaries and into the red blood cells. This is what this is showing you. And you saw that was the um, animation from the previous, previous slides. Okay. Um, carbon dioxide will diffuse out following its concentration gradient, right? So the mighty hemoglobin molecule. So you've got blood and part of blood, not all of it, but part of the blood is made up of these red blood cells. And again, if I look more closely at a red blood cell, I find that it has got thousands and thousands of these hemoglobin molecules in it. And this is where oxygen is headed, right? So again, if I look more closely, here's my red blood cell, and here's a hemoglobin molecule that's made up, it's a protein, and it's made up of these four uh, chains of amino acids. And in the middle of each one of them is an iron atom, right? Is an iron atom. So this is why you need iron in your diet, right? And it is this iron atom that actually will hold on to the oxygen. And remember, I've said before, oxygen is very reactive. It always goes around as a diatomic molecule, O2, not just O, but O2. And so iron will hold on to it, reacts with, it's like rust, right? Um, your blood is red because it's rusty. <laughs> um, you know, oxygen in the air reacts with iron and forms iron oxide, which we call rust and has that reddish color, right? So this oxygen is gonna act, react with the iron and be held um, by the iron in hemoglobin. And that's how the oxygen is transported um, around the body. Okay, so the red blood cell, here's oxygen from the lungs. So hemoglobin in the red cells, red blood cells carries the oxygen when it's then released at two cells that require it. Again, following a concentration gradient. So where there is low oxygen, the oxygen will be released to that place, okay? Released to the tissues. Right, let's just keep track here. Number 19. Uh, so there's that diagram, which gas is leaving the alveolus to enter the red blood cells, 
which gas is leaving the red blood cells to enter the alveolus? So I know you guys can answer that. Uh, if I went, question 20, if I went looking for a hemoglobin molecule, where would I find it? Okay, so obviously I would find it in a red blood cell. Uh, each red blood cell contains highlight one. Okay, so one hemoglobin molecule, 100 or 200 million or more. Okay, so now that question you will get from this video. You know, the answer to that question you'll get from this video. You breathe in about 17,000 times per day. It's a process you rarely think about, but behind the scenes, a huge coordinated effort is playing out. Your vital organs, the gut, brain, bones, lungs, blood, and heart work together to sustain your life by delivering oxygen to tissues throughout your body. Most of our cells need oxygen because it's one of the key ingredients of aerobic respiration. That's the process that produces a molecule called ATP. Our cells use to power their many incredible functions. But getting oxygen throughout our bodies is a surprisingly difficult task. Gas enters cells by diffusing in from their surroundings, and that only happens efficiently over tiny distances. So, for oxygen to reach the cells within our bodies, it needs a transportation network. This is where our 20 trillion red blood cells come in. One contains about 270 million oxygen-binding molecules of hemoglobin, which is what gives blood its scarlet hue. To make these cells, the body uses raw materials that become available from the food we eat. So in some ways, you could say that oxygen's journey through the body really begins in the gut. Here, in an amazing display of mechanical and chemical digestion, food gets broken down into its smallest elements like iron, the building block of hemoglobin. Iron is carried through the cardiovascular system to the body's hematopoietic tissue. This tissue is the birthplace of red blood cells, and it is found enclosed within our bone marrow cavities. The kidneys regulate our levels of red blood cells through the release of erythropoietin, a hormone which causes marrow to increase production. Our bodies churn out roughly 2.5 million red blood cells per second, a number equivalent to the entire population of Paris, so that oxygen that makes it to the lungs will have ample transportation. But before oxygen can even reach the lungs, the brain needs to get involved. The brainstem initiates breathing by sending a message through your nervous system, all the way to muscles of the diaphragm and ribs. This causes them to contract thus increasing the space inside the ribcage, which allows the lungs to expand. That expansion drops your lungs' internal air pressure, making air rush in. It's tempting to think of our lungs as two big balloons, but they're actually a lot more complicated than that. Here's why. The red blood cells in the vessels within your lungs can only pick up oxygen molecules that are very close to them. If our lungs were shaped like balloons, air that was not in direct contact with the balloon's inner surface couldn't use through. Luckily, lungs architecture ensures that very little oxygen is wasted. Their interior is divided into hundreds of millions of miniature balloon-like projections called alveoli that dramatically increase the contact area to somewhere around 100 square meters. The alveolar walls are made of extremely thin, flat cells that are surrounded by capillaries. Together, the alveolar wall and capillaries make a two-cell thick membrane that brings blood and oxygen close enough for diffusion. These oxygen-enriched cells are then carried from the lungs through the cardiovascular network, a massive collection of blood vessels that reaches every cell in the body. If we laid this system out end-to-end -end in a straight line, the vessels would wrap around the earth several times. Propelling red blood cells through this extensive network requires a pretty powerful pump, and that's where your heart comes in. The human heart pumps an average of about 100,000 times per day, and it's 
the powerhouse that ultimately gets oxygen where it needs to go, completing the body's team effort. Thing. Entire complex system is built around the delivery of tiny molecules of oxygen. If just one part malfunctioned, so would we. Breathe in. Your gut, brain, bones, lungs, blood, and heart are continuing their incredible act of coordination that keeps you alive. Breathe out. Okay. All right. So that was, um, I think, a really good summary of um, how red blood cells deliver oxygen to the rest of the body and we pick, we pick oxygen up from the alveoli. Okay. So just to keep track of our, our guided notes here, so you have the answer there for question 21, right? So he said 270 million hemoglobin molecules in a red blood cell. Uh, question 22, how many iron atoms do you find in one hemoglobin molecule? And so you may have to go back and find that answer. And then oxygen is very reactive and will rarely be found in a single atom. It usually goes around paired to itself as O2. So how many O2 molecules does one hemoglobin molecule carry? So again, um, I showed you what a hemoglobin molecule looked like. Give me a second while I get there. So this is hemoglobin, and remember it has four iron atoms, and each one will hold on to an oxygen, a diatomic molecule of oxygen, right? So your and will give you the answer there for number 23. So one hemoglobin molecule can carry one, two, three, four oxygen molecules. Okay, and then 24 and 25, just a little bit of math, right? So if a given red blood cell has 270 million hemoglobin molecules and each one carries four, there's your answer. Oxygen molecules, how many oxygen molecules does one red blood cell carry? Okay. And then I want you to put that into words for question 25. Okay, you'll put your answer in words for question 25. Okay, so um, at any given time, you will have oxygen gas and carbon dioxide inside your alveoli. Where does the oxygen gas come from and what is the carbon dioxide gas a result of? Okay, so that's just a, a um, refresher for us. So where does that oxygen gas come from? It comes from the atmosphere and was produced by photosynthesis, right? And the carbon dioxide is a result of cellular respiration. So that links back to what we were talking about right at the beginning of this lesson. So mechanical movements of um, allow the passage of air in and out of your body. Okay, so now we're going to look at the mechanics of this. Breathing, so the brain detects, remember the autonomic nervous system controls your rate of breathing. So it detects the rate of breathing by responding to the internal stimuli that indicate how much oxygen the body needs. And so when there's a high concentration of carbon dioxide in the blood, the breathing rate will increase. Okay, and so why would this be? And this links to your question 26. Why does the rate of breathing increase when carbon dioxide levels are high? Right? So when you think about it, if you've got high carbon dioxide levels, it means that your cellular respiration must be in hyperdrive, producing all of that carbon dioxide. Well, if cellular respiration is high, it means you need more oxygen, right? So you will then have to breathe faster, A, to get rid of the carbon dioxide, and B, to provide the oxygen that your cells seem to require at that time, right? A higher need for oxygen. So uh, your breathing rate will increase because you need to get rid of the waste product, carbon dioxide, and increase your intake of oxygen. And why do we need to increase our breathing rate during exercise? Two reasons. Okay, so again, I've kind of just given them to you. So if you're exercising, cellular respiration is happening, 
more quickly, which means you require more oxygen and you need to get rid of carbon dioxide at a faster rate. All right. So for question 28, let's see. So during inhalation, the diaphragm will contract and this causes the chest cavity to expand and the diaphragm moves down, allowing air to move into the lungs. So it's about pressure changes. So this is the mechanical part of breathing, right? So um, take a deep, 28, take a deep breath in. Did your chest cavity expand or did it contract? Right? And hopefully it expanded. And what happened to the volume inside your chest cavity? Did it increase or decrease? So your chest cavity expanded, which means that the volume must have increased. And what happened to the pressure inside your chest cavity? So if the volume increased, then the pressure must have decreased, okay? Because you have more space for the gases in there. So your pressure would decrease. Did your diaphragm relax or did it contract? You can see here it contracted, right? And so by contracting, it, it pulled down and caused the increase in your chest cavity, the increase in volume in your chest cavity. And of course, the reverse is true when you exhale. So now exhale, and did your cavity expand or contract? So it contracted. And what happened to the volume? So the volume, if, you're, if you're, um, the cavity contracted, that means the volume must have decreased. And if the volume decreased, then that means the pressure must have increased. And as pressure increases, then that will force air out of your lungs. And your diaphragm then will relax. So you have your answers there, 31 through 36. Okay, and then here's another um, animation showing you how all of that happens. Diaphragm contracts and so causes the rib cage to, um, to rise up, increasing that cavity there, which means that the pressure will decrease and air rushes in. And then when the diaphragm relaxes, causes the cavity then to fall, decreases the volume, increases pressure and gas will escape. All right, so now we're gonna look at some respiratory diseases. Um, and so a collapsed lung, what happens to lung pressure and air movement if there is a hole in the chest wall that allows air to move into that space between the chest wall and the lungs? And you'll give an answer there for both inhalation and exhalation. So based on what we just talked about in terms of creating, um, you know, a, a decrease in pressure and an increase in pressure, of course, that all uh, assumes that you don't have a hole in the system. What if you had a hole in that system, right? If you had a collapsed lung, which um, is what happens if there is a hole right, if there is a space, a hole in the chest wall that allows air to move in and out of that space. And I'm gonna let you think about that and you can um, answer question 37 uh, in your own time. Okay, and question 38, so you have which combination of terms is accurate for inhalation and you'll highlight one of those. So again, for question 38, you can just go back to this animation here, or you can go back to this slide here in order to answer question 38, and also question 39, right? So this slide will help you with question 39. Okay, so respiratory diseases. So I'm now up to question 40. If bronchi and alveoli cannot do their jobs, how does this affect the body? Okay. So some diseases or disorders irritate, inflame, or infect the respiratory system. And these can cause tissue damage that it reduce the ability of the bronchi and the alveoli to do their jobs, making respiration difficult. 
And so let's discuss this. If bronchi and alveoli cannot do their jobs, how does this affect the body? So if you look at this image here and you see a healthy bronchiole, right, which is a tube, if it is diseased or has, um, you know, got some kind of um, respiratory ailment and it may be inflamed, right? So inflammation causes this thickening of the wall here. Well, of course, if this wall is thicker, then there's less space here. There's less air, uh, there's less passage here for air to flow. Also, um, with a result of inflammation, there may be this excess mucus here. And again, if you have mucus here, then that is even less space for air to travel. Uh, and so if this mucus spills out into your alveoli and your alveoli start to fill up with mucus, then you can see that um, passage of oxygen and carbon dioxide is going to be very difficult. And this will result in um, sometimes emphysema. So emphysema is a condition where you have difficulty breathing because you have this excess mucus in your lungs. Uh, this is actually a true image of a smoker's lung, right? The one that is black. Uh, and there's a question here. Look at the last slide. This is the last slide, almost. Um, the image on the left shows a cross-section of the lung of someone who smoked. Uh, what are these small black dots here? So now that you know your way around the lung, you know what all of this stuff is. So these uh, little kind of, they're tubes. These are the bronchioles and they end up in these little guys. And of course, by now, you know that these are alveoli. Alveolus is the singular. These are alveoli and look how they're just covered in black stuff. So those, this person would have had great difficulty breathing. Okay, and this is as a result of smoking. All right, so, um, and there is an assignment on Ed Puzzle, and this is about how COVID-19 affects the respiratory system. And of course, you know, since we are in this pandemic, um, I think it would be, um, you know, it's essential for us to know exactly how this virus is impacting our respiratory system since it is a respiratory disease. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna end that here. Uh, your job is to finish up um, answering these questions, right? The ones um, that I said you should stop and go back to, and then also to do this assignment on Edpuzzle. Okay, and that's it for me. So I am just going to find my button here.